One thing, Adam Beach played a role since the very beginning, actually, of our dialogue about this show, about your work for the interview, is the kind of connection about literature. And one of the things is, I mean, we put it here in the text, Adam Curtis is not an artist. You were extremely concerned from the beginning with this exhibition that we might contextualize <coughs> your practice here as the practice of an artist and not as a journalist. But you always said that somehow, maybe, the connection to being a novelist is something which is uh, closer to you. And I'm kind of interested in this connection to mainly 19th century uh, literature. Um, the, the connection to, to Balzac, for example, is very important, but also connection to more recent literature, um, those pastors, for example, um, uh, is important. So I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about this and how you feel about the way journalism is kind of actually typically following very often journalistic ethics, transparency, objectivity, and how you feel that actually a journalist, kind of a journalism in general, would somehow benefit maybe from a more authorial or also mediated approach to the presentation of fact. <laughs> um. I do, well, okay, let's go back to literature. I do think, I've learned far more from novels than I have from any visual culture. I know it's a bit odd in, um, since I make films, but I'm always interested in how you tell stories, and novels teach you how to tell stories, and, and novelists are much more interested in that. Why I like 19th century novels, and I'm going to go back to what I've just been talking about, is that they did two things. They wrote about the individual and the individual's feelings, but they also, at the same time, pulled back and, talk, and put those individuals in the context of the society and, and the power structures in which they live. That's what Tolstoy's all about. You, you go from tiny little details to vast panoramas of history. And I find that very, very exciting. I find most modern novels excruciating because they're all one voice. They're, they're all stuck within the voice of the individual who's writing it. And even if there are a number of characters, the voice tends to be the same. And I think that's very limiting. I'm much more interested in how you can tell stories, which is both about individual <coughs> and I think this is the trick for anything in the future, is how, how you can keep our desire to be free individuals, which is the thing of our age, and yet at the same time reconnect with society and politics, which we have disconnected from. Because society is so interesting, it's, it's just fascinating the way we as groups behave. I mean, I do find it fascinating, for example, that computers look at us as groups and can tell us how we behave and how similar we are to each other in ways that we've just completely forgotten about. And, and I, that's why I like literature. Sorry, I'm going back to the same subject. Again. No, but it's interesting because it leads us also back to, to Balzac and we once discussed about you rereading uh, Le Père Goriot and uh, we discussed about this idea also that you think it transcends somehow the world in which it was set, the polyphony um, you mentioned. I was wondering, I mean, one earlier today we spoke about your Mayfair set, which is um, a very important piece of yours, and uh, there also Balzac played a role. Can you maybe tell us very concretely to which extent somehow Balzac inspired the Mayfair set? I feel that Hansel is trying to push me to say that I'm a novelist. I'm not. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a hack. I'm a journalist. That's all I do. Uh, but I love... I mean, there are two types of journalists. There are journalists who do general stuff, and there are journalists who tell stories. I'm a journalist who tells stories. I have always wanted to be able to do factual stuff that, that gives you the sense of, that you have when you're reading a good novel. You like going into that world, and that's what I tried to do for the Mayfair set, which was about four men who met in a gambling club in the 1950s who then transformed Britain. And I just thought it was a very good vehicle in to telling the story of the world, a bit like a novel. It's nowhere near as good as a novel. It's a piece of journalism. But I mean, yeah, novels inspire you because I like stories. People like stories. And when I asked you about kind of contemporary novels, um, you actually gave me the same answer Philip Fareno gave me the other day, that uh, there's this interesting Alan Moore, uh, and the whole idea how he actually does very complicated things in narrative and uh, does them yet in a sort of entertaining pop way. And, this kind of reminded me of a conversation I had with Alain Rob Brier. And Alain Rob Brier told me that at the beginning of his work, that for him and, uh, and Godard, we once traveled with Alain Rob Brier through Iceland with uh, different artists and uh, actually kind of interviewed him. It was another sort of polyphonic interview. And Rob Brier kept referring to this moment of the beginning of the Nouveau Roman and the beginning of the Nouvelle Vague. And it was kind of possible to make most experimental work, which was yet somehow pop and which has also reached far beyond the world of literature and, um, and cinema and in, into society. 
which is true for, for early Nouveau Roman and for early Godard, for example. Um, I was kind of wondering to which extent you see this today in Alan Moore and why you think that he's one of the great novelists of our time. Well, that's you again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just like Watchmen. I think it's a brilliant book. I mean, and I like, I mean, it's, you know, it's just really good because I don't know how many of you have read Watchmen by Alan Moore, uh, but he is just, <coughs> it's just brilliant the way he, ca he has a number of different stories going at the same time and uses picture and words and they're sometimes all working together. And I often think that every, every generation, I mean, I know this from television, always thinks it's got there. It, they think that that's it, that, that nothing else will ever be invented. I think what you can see in things like Alan Moore is that in the future, people are going to do things where lots of stories are going on at the same time, and if they're skilled enough, we'll go with them. And, and, and that's really fascinating. And it's sort of, again, with Alan Moore, you get a glimmering of what's coming, that with picture, words. I mean, I just remember that bit in Watchmen when the guys, the, the kids reading the comic about the pirates, and he uses this comic book where the guy's reading within a comic book to comment on other parts of the story, sometimes ironically, sometimes very emotionally. It's just so clever, and it's so pop. And what I mean by pop is that it is, it's clear, not pretentious, not talking down to people, and is, is of the culture of its time. It's not trying to step outside and be snobbish, elitist, or anything like that. It's getting the, the feelings of its audience. I'm doing it now. Now, in terms of writing, there is also one thing we never really discussed in the part one and part two of the interview, is your blog. And uh, it came to my mind again when you showed that small fragment about Afghanistan. It's kind of interesting because very, from the very beginning when we spoke about uh, the New York event, you always said you would show something related to um, Afghanistan. And on your blog, one of the most recent entry uh, is Kabul, city number one, which is something you're working on at the moment. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit, maybe in general, about the blog and what role the blog plays uh, in relation also to the making of your, of your films. And then maybe more particularly about this entry of Kabul, city number one. Uh, well, it really started because a man called Phil, who's a cameraman for the BBC, went out to Kabul and copied onto 16 drives all the unedited rushes of everything we've ever shot in Afghanistan and the BBC for the last 40 years and brought it all back to me. So I just had the whole of... I've still got it. Um, and I just decided to try and find a way of showing film at greater length. I just think it's a really interesting thing to do. You write text, describe what it is and show it, because it's what we don't do in the news, and the news becomes very, very formatted these days, very rigid. Just the idea of showing what the experience of stuff is like in a place like that is really good. So I just started doing that. Um, I don't think it's that great, it's just a sort of, it's, it's just a way of showing people more stuff, and showing people what it feels like to be there. That's what I do. Um, and I think Afghanistan is incredible, I don't know what it's like here, it's incredibly badly reported in that country. Incredibly badly. I mean, we're fighting a major war. And I just... You know. And Afghanistan leads us also to, uh, to Alighiero Boiti, because um, one of the big surprises of our collaboration and the dialogue uh, on this exhibition here was uh, to find out your interest in, in Boiti. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, if you talk, could talk a little bit about Boeti and, and individualism. I don't know how many people know about Boeti here. It, you know, I, I love Boeti because he's, well, I think he's beautiful. I mean, he's actually a modern artist who is beautiful. What he did was beautiful. Um, but what's interesting about him, why, I mean, I'm a journalist, so what I find interesting about him is that he's a tragic figure. He, he went off to Afghanistan with, and came up with this idea, he wants to break this idea of individual self-expression. I do think, I do think the idea of individual self-expression is one of the diseases of our age, if I might say so. I think in a hundred years' time, people will, you know the way we look back at the Victorian era, we certainly do in Britain, as an era of total conformity, where everyone went to church and everyone believed in the right thing, and everyone believed in the empire, and it wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't like that, but that's what we look at it as now. I think in a hundred years' time, people will look back at our age and say the conformity of our age was that everyone believed they were self-expressive individuals. I mean, I really do think that's a problem of our time. Uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry to sit in an art gathering and say this, but it also, I mean, I'm including myself in the same criticism. What Boetti was trying to do was confront that, as far as I know. He went off to Afghanistan, and he, he got these women who were weavers, and told them to make maps of the world just using the colours of the flags of those nations. What they then created was incredibly beautiful, and he saw it as a way of trying to challenge the idea of the individual self-expressive artist and transform it into something, I mean, you could look at it as, as medieval or something new. The tragedy is, is those maps now sell for millions and millions of dollars as personal self-expressions of Mr. Algieri A. Boetti. Whilst he was there, he bought a hotel in Kabul, he fell prey to the other disease of individualism of our time, which I think is heroin. Um, heroin is the ultimate drug of the bubble of the self. You go into an opiate bubble where all your feelings are calmed and the world is, those feelings are then projected onto the world. And he fell victim to that form of individualism and I think it contributed, I think it contributed to his death, you'd know more. Um, so he in a way is the tragic figure of our time. He tried to challenge this thing that I keep on going on about, this trap of the self and at the same time fell prey to it, both through the commerce of the art world and through his own desire to possibly escape himself through drugs. And maybe a last question before we open it up is about uh, the future. Panofsky said, um, the uh, great art historian, that we always invent uh, or make up the future made out of fragments uh, from the past. And you told me that seeing the future is all about making sense of the... Um, of the fragments. So I was sort of wondering what you see in the fragments. What's the future? That's <laughs> <laughs> so, Sorry? Um, it's a tea leaves question. Um, journalists don't see the future. Journalists just report on what's here and now. But every, every age gets trapped by the way they stitch the fragments together. That's true. I mean, I, know, I don't know about art. I know, but I, what I do know about television reporting. And television reporting has become so rigid that people don't look at what is shown any longer. It's like, you know when they put on a book, a book cover, a famous painting, and after a well, while you just don't look at the painting anymore, you go, oh, it's that book cover. It, 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 that's what's happened to television news, you don't look at it. And then every now and then something comes along where they reconfigure the fragments. Back in the 50s, they, uh, American journalism invented a thing called new journalism, which they mythologize a bit these days. But it was, it, it, actually, it was the beginning of the age of individualism. People like Tom Wolfe would, would, would go off and write about how Phil Spector felt inside himself. And he invented a new form of journalism which fitted with the new mood that was inside people's brains. I think there is a new mood inside people's brains at the moment, but we don't know what it is. And no one's quite got it yet. I haven't got it. I mean, I just go back to the past and stitch old stuff together. No one's, no one's got it. But I know there's a mood. There is a mood in people's brain. I know I've got one in, in my own brain. But it, no, one, no one's quite sort of brought it out and, and, and made it real for people. I'm sure someone will. Some, I, I mean, I haven't seen anyone do it. But, but you know that woman I showed you right at the beginning? She said, I don't believe in anything. <coughs> Actually, I don't think in my society, Britain, anyone believes in anything either. I mean, not as dramatically as her. But they don't. They don't. Politics is a technocratic exercise in management now. It has absolutely no values apart from keeping things steady. A stable state, which is the managerial concept. Outside that, people don't believe in anything. They believe in themselves, but that's about it. And they know that actually they have very little control of their own self. Which is why they're obsessed by their own bodies, because that's about the last thing they can manage. That's it. And there is a mood behind all that, and no one's quite got it. Thank you so much. We now open it. Questions, Bob and Kirk. Yeah, there's a question here. Yeah, I wanted to back to your talk. I think it's like Zerkov and Pavlovsky that are... Could you speak a little bit louder, please? We have to... If you like Zerkov and Pavlovsky that are behind Russia United, it's incredible right now. Um, and you talk about how they have this kind of tactic, although not as much known about the individuals, but kind of playing one group off of the yeah. next. 
find it very interesting at the end you were talking about Occupy, which in many ways was related to kind of anonymous and, well, at least it was, uh, at least in the beginning, propelled by online and that's how the word word spread. That ideology that it's in the center of anonymous, I'm sure you've heard of the so-called hive mind. It's, mm -hmm. it's not unlike the kind of cybernetic dream. Yeah, yeah. Well, what do you, I was wondering what your take on uh, those very same figures in the Kremlin and you've seen a lot of it through RT and various Russian state control media's interest in the Occupy movement and the concept of the hive mind is that you're talking about what it would take to be formed in opposition <coughs> to power like that. I don't and think it's the hive mind. I don't. Right? I, I really don't think it's the hive mind. I mean, I have real problems with the hive mind because actually, but I, I think it's playing totally into the hands of the very thing you're trying to challenge. Because if you actually analyze the hive mind, it's not a million miles away from Adam Smith's idea of the invisible hand, which is the very basis of the idea of the free market capitalism. It's this idea that you don't have leaders, because leaders can't understand what individuals want. So therefore you allow the hive, lots of individuals to express in capitalism, it's called their preferences, and out of the, the interaction of those preferences, you will get a mutual agreement, and out of that will come a stable market. Now, I don't see that as being very different. But I, I, I mean, I'm simplifying ruthlessly here. But, but I think it's necessary to simplify, because I think it shows the weakness of the hive mind. Serkov manipulates the hive mind ruthlessly, because he plays with it. What you have in Russia is lots of millions and millions of individuals watching television with very little other information except what they get that way. And the, the crucial thing about the hive mind is where do they get their information from? <coughs> what do you know to decide what you want? I mean, the same can be asked about capitalism. I mean, you know, the idea of the invisible hand is absolute rubbish because you are, the only information you know about your preference is, is what Apple has decided to tell you. You know, it's what iTunes has. So therefore, both are wrong. I think it, you, you, you don't challenge the hive mind if by the hive mind you mean lots and lots of individuals somehow mutually agreeing and becoming a non-hierarchical new kind of order. No, you don't. You assemble the hive mind. And you either do what Serkov does, which is manipulate it ruthlessly, or you assemble it by inspiring people to surrender themselves. I mean, the thing I'm really interested in, I do think it's a really, really interesting area, is the utopian socialists that were before Karl Marx. Uh, back in the, I know this sounds obscure, but it's not. In the 1830s and the 1840s, there were people like Charles Fourier, Saint-Simon. Before people started talking about economics, <coughs> they tried, they had this idea that you could emotionally transport people. I mean, Fourier talked about the idea of love. Now, the most embarrassing thing you can do today is to talk about the idea of love as something you surrender yourself to. Because we don't believe that anymore. Right? We believe that love is between two equal people. His idea was that you give yourself up to people. Like being really in love, which you just give yourself to someone. You lose yourself in something. That's what the hive mind doesn't do. It just can't. It's not allowed to do it by the definition of it. It's the hive, it, the hive doesn't have a purpose, does it? The hive agrees a purpose which somehow emerges out of it. It's the cybernetic idea. I mean, to be honest, what I think about the hive mind and cybernetics is that it's modern managerial theory. It's about managing, and because what the hive mind says is everyone, it keeps it stable. So you all go, either go like that or you go like that, and out of all that, I'm, I'm being nasty, but it's sort of, it, it is limiting. Whereas you take people somewhere else by saying, this is so extraordinary and so beautiful and so inspiring that you would want to give yourself up to this and lose yourself in it. Do you see what I mean? Something, I mean the phrase is, something grander than you. And that's something that a hive mind can't deal with. And, and I do think this is the area some, that the opposition, the left, haven't really confronted yet. I mean, it's true in my country, they are just complete, it's, it's outrageous what the left has like, failed to take people with, with them and offer an alternative. Sorry, I'm going on too much, it's something I'm, I guess a bit worked up about. The question here on the left and then a question in the middle. Yeah, you. Um, you've been mentioning these 
kind of collective experiences that groups of people can lose themselves in. And you also just mentioned how bland television views in particular has become. Do you think that journalism should be one of these experiences? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, not necessarily journalism, but something. I mean, television is still... Printed journalism is dying, see, unless someone invents a, a new kind of new journalism. Television is thriving. Um, and also, because you can now watch again, they could be longer and more complicated. Like uh, Alan Moore's stuff is very complicated. You want, you want to go back and look at it again. I still think there are going to be television programmes that, that are going to get much more complicated. Yes, I do. And I wish someone would do it. What about ethics in the so-called view from nowhere? Is that something that should be abandoned? What do you mean? Um, kind of this especially American journalistic ideal of complete objectivity and kind of a divorce from narratives or ideology. I think it's, it would be foolish for journalists to, to neglect the attempt to be objective. I mean, I'm objective in the facts that I put in my stuff. And I think you have to keep to that. Of course you do. That's the fundamental rule of journalism. But it doesn't necessarily mean you can't then say, this means this. It doesn't mean you're being ideological. I mean, I'm, I would dispute that I'm ideological in my films. I, I have an argument. And I'm saying, have you thought of it this way? And sometimes I'm being provocative. And sometimes I'll change my mind in the next. I mean, at some point after the other day, the century of the self that I made is a perfect neoconservative tract. I mean, it, 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 I'm just trying to push. And I think journalism could do that more. It's, it's, it's more than bland. It's just really rigid. And it's, it's, no, it's worse than that. It's not actually reporting the world to us these days. It's reporting received ideas. So much of them, it's just not true. I mean, I'm investigating... Do you remember the Lockerbie bomb? Which we now think was Libya. It wasn't Libya at all. And everyone knows that. But again and again and again on the news, it's Libya. That's the problem. No one's challenging a lot of it at the moment. We two questions here. The question in the middle and the question here. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I like most about your films is what drew me into them is uh, the, the very grave world historical narratives uh, set to images that are often, that often make a lot of use of pitch and humor. Uh, and can you just talk a little bit about why you use these sort of, you know, like sort of things like the image of like the this, the Putinist ra youth rally, which, you know, is on one level terrifying, but also totally goofy. What, this? Yeah, yeah, that you, uh, that you showed earlier. Um, can you just talk about your use of pitch and humor? I like being silly. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I think other people like being silly, and I think a lot of journalism is very pompous. And there are two things. One, one is I like being silly. Because I mean, I just, when I see something that makes me laugh, I see other people make it laugh, and we would also like it. Um, also, if you do want to tell stories and have ideas with it, it's sometimes very, very difficult to illustrate it. So, what you have to do is just let your mind be focused and go for the thing you like. And often it can be quite silly. But if you if it sort of occurs to you that it's appropriate, then it's probably people will get what you're on about. If it's if you honestly believe it. But it's just I mean it's it's what I said about being pop. It's 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 attaching an idea to what you feel emotionally, however silly, when you first spotted that image or something like that. That's the way people think these days. I mean, everyone is a bit silly these days. Silliness is part of our... A uh, posh person would call it, it's the trope of our time. I mean, I'm silly. Uh, it, it, it's just... It's nice. And, then, and also, people relax. You know if you're having a chat with someone the first time you've met them, and they're a bit silly. You quite like it. it, it there's nothing wrong with doing that in a film either. I mean, I don't do that consciously, but it's sort of like... I'm just not being pompous. I mean, none of these are very good answers. I just do it. <laughs> Sorry. There's a question here in the middle. Um, so I was really struck by what you said earlier about uh, politics in the West being more about managing uh, managing what already exists instead of an international program. Because it seems like in the United States, the past uh, the conservative movements that we've had that have had any sort of influence in government have actually been ex had extremely transformative 
programs. Yeah. They haven't been successful, but I'm thinking of the neoconservative movement, which yeah. you talked about in Power Nine years, and then the Tea Party movement. <coughs> so, I mean, you already have talked a lot about the neocons in your work. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what you see in the Tea Party and what forces created it and maybe where it's headed. Well, it was a populist I mean, I, you probably know more about American history than I do. I mean, it was a populist movement. I mean, it, it, it goes back to progressivism, which is this funny... I mean, it, it, it's really only interesting... I mean, I thought it was, its influence was on the way in, but I think it, it sort of comes out of that fusion of left and right, which you saw in the... Um, what was the movement that, that did try to stop America going into the Second World War? America First movement. It, it's, that, it's that... I mean, again, it's a glimmer. <coughs> That, that the traditional ideas of politics don't always have to be like that. And it's, it's radical in the sense that it, it challenges elites, bankers. It's also nasty because it can easily slip into anti-Semitism and to <coughs> fascist paranoid manipulation. Uh, what's interesting about it is, which I noticed a lot of liberals had, again, like with their reaction to Limonov, is they think it's dangerous. Now, there's a funny part of me that thinks whenever a political movement is dangerous, that doesn't necessarily mean it's all bad. Because politics is about thrill and about danger. Because what you mean by danger is you can get people. You can grab them. <clears throat> and quite frankly, the Occupy movement doesn't grab people. It did to begin with. It was brilliant at it. And then it just blew it. Whereas the right somehow has this consistent ability to grab people and run with it. We look at Fox News. They're having fun. Actually, not so much these days, but they used to be. You know, whereas if you listen to National Public Radio, not, and the BBC Radio 4, they're not having fun. They're doing what is expected of them by their elders and their betters. And they shouldn't. Because that's not how you change the world. It's as simple as that. So yeah, the right are good. I mean, Tahir Square, right? What you're now seeing emerging in Egypt is really the Reagan revolution for Egypt. I mean, it's the counter-revolution against state planning, Colonel Nasser, all that. That's what the Muslim Brotherhood are. They're going to grab it because they've got an alternative to those old liberal ideas which were seen to have failed in Egypt, and people wanted it. It's, it's the same thing. You've got a lower middle class rising up in Egypt, just as you had in my country in the 70s and you had here, much better educated than their parents, who want to break through a liberal class that's sitting on top of them. That's what's happening in Egypt. And the Muslim Brotherhood, whatever you think of them, and I think they're cultural conservative and not very nice, uh, are actually making the running, because they've got a vision, an idea. And the liberals, huh? <laughs> Sorry, that was cruel. <laughs> Going back to your uh, early idea of the bluff, could of, you, of, sorry, of the bluff, of the bluff, of you, love. Yeah, could you address it a bit? From my point of view, the problem right now we have is there's no a real two different subjects if one left to. And how will someone be able to find that if you were, What do you mean there's no different? Like Soviet Russia is as corrupt as USA. We don't have anything we can choose from this that's really different. Like how could you find that if your political lovers as bad as your ex-lovers. <laughs> 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 well, that is the problem of our time. The team, you know, the team the team. You're trapped between two, two ex-lovers. Do <laughs> 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 you hate? Do you distrust? So, 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 how are we able to choose there's no real difference? You're waiting for someone else to come along who you fall in love with and want to surrender yourself to. I mean, that's what... That's what the new politics is going to be. So I think it's as simple as that. You want to something that, that, that you really want to give yourself to, and which is difficult in our age because people don't want to give themselves to other things or to other people. I mean, the, the, I don't know if I read a fascinating book about <coughs> studying online dating the other day, which is called Cold Intimacies, with sociologists kind of looked at it, who argues that, that love has been completely redefined in our age as an economic system of matching each other. I should have it's a very complicated story. <laughs> but, but the idea of surrendering yourself in love is sort of not of our time. But back to your question, we're, wait, we're waiting for someone else. <laughs> There's a question here on the left, yeah. Um, 
I found, I love the presentation, but I found the conclusion slightly surprising, but this idea that we should surrender ourselves to a higher ideal of the politics of the future, in the sense that a lot of your films actually demonstrate how certain ideas or people have actually, they've, these movements have led to power being entrenched in deeper ways, or the people have been manipulated in more ways than they imagined originally. I'm thinking here, uh, Power of Nightmares, for example, yeah. uh, all watched over by machines in a loving place. I mean, how do you feel? How do you feel about that observation that there is that there is a tension in your work that you acknowledge that sometimes giving yourself to an idea actually has really disastrous. Can, can be terribly dangerous. No, I agree. I mean, it's a good question because well, there are two answers. To that one, I'm a creature of my time. I have made a series of films which have been analysing why the the optimistic movements of the last 100 years didn't quite work out as they were supposed to. So in a way that has been my, the sort of project that I've been engaged in. <clears throat> the other is, yeah, it is really dangerous and often it goes wrong. And it has gone wrong and that's why we distrust it. And I sometimes think that the reason why we believe so much in individualism today is not just because it suits capitalism or consumer capitalism, it's because actually after the Second World War, the generation who came out of that war were frightened of mass movements. They'd seen what it had done, and they promoted, I don't think it was a conspiracy, but they promoted the idea of the free individual as an alternative. My argument now is that we're sort of trapped by that, uh, and we're still waiting, and we're waiting for something to come along. It, what I'm saying is that you're not really going to be able to challenge something unless you unite people, because that's what makes people powerful by being pulled, it's what trade unions are about. You are much more powerful when you are in a group than if you are on your own. And I think since 2008, people have increasingly, especially in my country, come to realize that alone they are much less powerful than, but no one's offering them a way of uniting. I don't think the hive mind is doing it. But I mean, you're right. I'm being a hypocrite. It's true. <laughs> but you know, the question here. Yeah. Yes, uh, so two questions. First, your work is really brilliant television. Why is it an on television in this country as far as I can tell? And second, what kind of discussion does your work stimulate in uh, Why is there no American television? All sorts of reasons. Uh, one copyright. <clears throat> it co I mean, the real problem, under the BBC, I like playing with music. It's music by the films. I love playing with music. Um, under the BBC, what's called the Blanket Agreement, I can use practically any music I want, except in America. Um, it, we'd have to pay fortunes to use it, and I really can't be bothered to change it. Um, secondly, I noticed that it was much better to get on the internet than to be on television. Very early on, from about 2000, and, when did the century itself? 2001, 2002, I just noticed that actually, People liked finding things out themselves. If it was a little bit naughty, it was good. And I suspect that, that, that no, I'm being serious, it, 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 that I, more people watch my films on the internet in this country than they would have if they'd been on PBS. And also the people who run PBS don't really like my sort of films. They just don't. They think I'm too silly. Really. Um, that's not a very good answer, but... And what's, the other question was, what kind of the public discussion would you Quite a lot. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. I mean, yeah. Positive, negative? Both. <laughs> I mean, how do, what do I say? I mean, I deliberately provoke it. I mean, people write about your films a lot? Yes, they do. Okay. I mean, what am I going to say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I push. Yeah. Because I think that's what one should do. I mean, I like the idea of telling a story and then on the top of that saying, what I think this means is this, have you thought of it that way? Sometimes I get caught, like with that guy, pointing out that I'm like, saying something else the next time. But, you know, that's what journalists do. There's a guy right at the back. At the very end, yeah, we have a question in the middle. Say that again. I wanted to ask you about violence. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking of Lebanon's um, image shooting the gun. Yeah. And I'm thinking your ideas about the self and dissolving the self is in bigger power that are fine. But in a world where power ultimately comes down to state power, and state power is uh, underlain by 
If you feel strong enough that you want to challenge those in power, sometimes you have to use violence. I'm not in any way saying that's good or bad. Yeah? Well, what do you say to the people in Syria? Oh, don't shoot, it's nasty. No, I mean, I think the most interesting thing of our time in, uh, in Britain and in America is the way, although power hasn't gone away, it seems to have gone away, and with it, the sort of questions you're asking. In the past, previous generations were very aware that if you want to change things, people in power hold on to power, and they talked about power. In our age, we live in a Wes Anderson movie. It's like we're all, we're all happy, and we're all twee. Do you remember the bit in the end of a film I really love? Um, the one where he's the, uh, the Jack Cousteau. The life of Cratter. At the end of it, there is there, uh, Bill Murray is sitting in his submarine with lots of other like cute little Wes Anderson people. And he expresses the ideology, which I think expresses the ideology of our age, which is, we're all a bit crap, but that's okay. And that's it. Well, actually, no, it's not. You live in a crap system where people in power, I mean, in this country, the, 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 the elite with the money are just going off into the stratosphere and leaving you lot behind. Same is true in my country to a lesser extent. We're all crap and it's all a bit okay. No, it's not. It, 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 there's the sort of, there's a tweenness, a whimsy to our idea of society at the moment, also promoted by the hive mind. That, that somehow we're all in this together. We're not. There's power. And sometimes you have to challenge power. I mean, sometimes with violence like in Syria. Hopefully not in this country. Hopefully not in my country. But it does involve really serious questions about power. And actually, it's thrilling when power comes back into focus. Bo Zhilai, the guy who was head of the mayor of Chongqing in China. Do you know the story I'm talking about? Who's just been, his wife has just been accused of killing a British businessman and has rocked the Politburo in China. It's wonderful when something like that happens because power comes back into focus and you realise how the world sort of works. It's disappeared in my country because they're all managers and they just want to hold it steady. I've sort of gone away from your question because I'm too frightened to answer it. It's it, it, one of the things that's very rarely even discussed. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and you know, your country, at various points, people took up arms. In mine, we had a revolution which took up arms. Yeah, violence is... power. People hold on to power really strongly. But it's like, disappeared. I, I don't know, I mean, I do think why power is not discussed is really fascinating. You go and exercise power in extraordinarily violent forms of war. I mean, my country as well. Iraq, Afghanistan. I'm not saying it's wrong. That we use extreme forms of violence there. And somehow we live in a bubble where none of that ever comes near us in our consciousness. It's always Anderson. He is the ideologist of our age. He really is. The question here? Yeah. Can you, just going back to your talk, can you say a little bit more about your suggestion that art and aesthetics potentially, that art and aesthetics potentially? Has so much power. What, because what it inspires it. Doesn't it? I mean, if you go back, say, to the Bolsheviks, oh, no, I know the revolution won't have crap. So, if you think about history, we were two famous big examples where art really came back to the world, and that's the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. Yeah. And I'm just fascinated by this belief that you've expressed. Well, I think. Well, I mean, I don't know enough about the history of art, but I've always thought its basic definition is that it has, a good art has the ability to take what is sitting inside people's minds that they are only dimly aware of in a sort of vague way and bring it out, make it concrete, and make it so people go, yes, that's what I feel. That, if you want to inspire people, is a very, very powerful thing to do. And I go back to what I said earlier on. I think there is a mood in people's minds that no one is getting to, and the politicians have completely given up on trying to get there. Totally. 
in Britain, they've just become managers because they're trying to keep a system stable that they know isn't quite working. And there is a mood in people's minds, and I think that art can do it, and that it can make it thrilling. At the moment, I do think, as I said right at the beginning, that art's become rather enmeshed in what we call the cultural industries, just very good at expressing what those in power want. And sometimes it does it extremely well. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to criticise art, I'm just saying it, it could have another role. I've got absolutely no idea what it is, but the great thing about history is you can't tell what it's going to be. Well, that leads us also to something we discussed actually um, in London at the time of the marathon when you know, we spoke about the family of man and we talked about the family of man as, a, as an exhibition of the kind of previous idea of um, everybody being an individual and then you know, obviously from there one could think uh, what could then be an exhibition uh, of the mood uh, of our time and one of the things we haven't really ever spoken about uh, and which I thought would be interesting to address here are your experiments with, uh, with punch drunk because you've been working with punch drunk for quite a long time, it's where we met for the first time in Manchester um, and you say that somehow uh, that for you has to do with the current moment in terms of immersion but you say yet at the same time with punch drunk you can go wherever you want uh, you can make your own story but it's still very difficult to tell a big story can you tell us about, um, I'm sorry I should probably speak louder can you tell us about this collaboration of punch drunk and uh, how that evolves. Because I hear also rumors that you might actually soon um, use the entire empty BBC building in London uh, and something might happen there. Um, I have to be a bit careful here because the man who commissioned the punch drunk thing is here, so I can't be too rude about what I did. But it, I don't know about how many of you know about this, but basically I did a film called It Felt Like a Kiss, which was at the centre of a, a, what's called an immersive theatre event. Punch Trunk did, what was it called, Sleep No More Theatre. It's so, this idea that you can go wherever you want and experience a, a piece of theatre that happens around you. And I did a piece with them, which, you know, because I'm obsessed by politics and power, I made it about politics and power. What I discovered about it, which I think is really interesting, is that Everyone loves it because it's an experience that they can make for themselves. You go into a building, vast building, I'm sure some of you have done this, and the thing is just happening around you, but you can go wherever you want. So, to use, put it in a pretentious way, you're making your own narrative. A bit like on the internet, you're going wherever you want, and that trail is your story. You can't tell anyone anything new that way, because if they are finding, if they are choosing which way to go, you can't take them on a story where you reveal new things to them. You can only give them elements that they sort of already know that they can then reconstruct in their own way. That's what I did in this. It was very exciting, but it was very liberating for me, and it was very good. But I thought it was intriguing because it showed, again, the problem of our time, which is that if everyone wants to just be an individual that is allowed to go wherever he or she wants, then whilst it is absolutely thrilling for that individual, it's quite limiting because all they're being told is something they already know. Because otherwise they don't have any way of navigating it. Because the function of journalism and of, and of novelists and, and of historians is to actually tell people new stuff. To say, actually, this is happening here and this means this. If you create a structure where people can create their own stories, that doesn't work any longer. Now, that doesn't mean going wherever you want. It's not a wonderful and thrilling thing. But it's, again, static, because it stops you going forward into another world that you didn't know anything about. And I, I was very intrigued by, in a way, the failure of it. People loved it, uh, and I really loved doing it, but it failed. Now, I think, ultimately, that kind of theatre is, in a way, the sort of, it's the mannerist, Version, the Baroque version of, you know, of, of our individualistic age. It's, it's the story of one. I mean, they're now doing one in, in um, London. I mean, not Punch Drunk, another of these immersive theatres. It's an audience of one. So, you know, you have about 100 actors and one audience. I mean, that's, to use the decadent in the proper way, that's the decadence of our age. It's devoted to you. The other thing that's interesting about it is that, no, that's enough. <laughs> but what about the, uh, the next step with this BBC building? Because I'm kind of fascinated because 
Uh, BBC has just moved, it just happened very recently to this new headquarters and this historic building uh, of many decades, which is, as you say, full of ghosts, is now empty. So I was very intrigued to hear that you know, something might happen in that building in London, or is it just a rumor? Uh, well, I'm not sure American always go very into this, but uh, no, I mean, it's a very big, vast building in the centre of London Television Centre, which is famous because it's where BBC lives. <coughs> it's going to be empty in a year's time. They've offered it to me on the basis of the um, punch run thing I did. Uh, would I like to do something in there the day it closes? So I suggested uh, that we have a gala evening which would celebrate Television Centre, presented by the most famous television presenter in Britain, who has agreed, actually, interesting enough. Halfway through, the show will go wrong. It might have to be taken off air because something was really happy. It's just gone wrong. <laughs> and it will go wrong. And at that point, just the screens will go blank. And television centre doors will open. And anyone can go in. And there'll be nothing there. There'll be the studio where it was happening left. And, and I mean, it's a vast building. It's just gigantic. And it's got tunnels underneath. And, and for three days it will be open. And anyone can come in now. And all sorts of strange things will happen to you. It's going to cost so much money, and there's so much health and safety issues that I don't think it's going to happen. But I thought it would be, I thought, I've always wanted to do a modern ghost story, and I thought it would be a good way of doing a modern ghost story about politics and power. <laughs> so, you know. Now, there is, the, there is the, the new office building, there is the ghost story in the old office building, and there's obviously that third building, and you referred very often in, in, our, in our conversations also today to this whole idea of the, of the BBC archive, this extraordinary archive which goes back, I think, more than 60 years. And um, you, you, once said that, you once told me that it's a warehouse near Heathrow, uh, one of the dark, grimmest and uh, weirdest places one can imagine. And I just wanted to kind of end with my last question um, about archives. If you could tell us a little bit about how this archive works, because I mean, for you it's a daily practice. It must be a place you very often go. Uh, and and uh, well, how, or maybe a weekly practice, or is it a monthly practice? How is this place organized? How I have no idea how to imagine it. Do you really want to know about Yeah, yeah, I want. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you won't throw this round. Um, <laughs> well, it is an extraordinary place. I mean, you have, it's the biggest archive in the world. It's 60 years of recorded experience of, of everything. And it's even, it's even more important. I mean, I'm now, I have now got this guy, Phil, going around the world assembling the rushes onto, onto computer drives, unedited rushes, everything we've shot. He's done, he's done, we've done Afghanistan, we've done India, we've done Russia. I've got 60 years of Russia. Um, I'm just assembling stuff. It's, it's slightly mad. I just, and I've always, I've just got this idea somehow we could do something with it. Uh, yeah, I spend a lot of my time looking at our film. It's quite hard. <laughs> It's a problem. <laughs> and thank you. Are there any more questions that anyone has? Yeah, we have maybe time for one or two urgent questions. There's a question here in the middle. I wonder if the problem that you talked about is immersive theatre, where everybody has their own experience, yeah. and that limits the kind of the amount of information or anything new that you can get with it. If, if kind of all of contemporary art has that problem, by in virtue of it being kind of designed for everybody to have their own experience, <laughs> they can. I mean the, 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 I mean, the real problem of our age is this fake idea of democracy, which I think is, again, a managerial idea of democracy. It goes back to the hive mind, which is, it's you, it's your story is the most important thing. You are the most important. It's, it's, it's what everyone believes at the moment, and you should be allowed to tell your story. You should be able to find your story. Personally, I thought I think about it, is that it actually reflects the failure of uh, a, a, a genuinely creative class. Television producers, artists, journalists, I'm talking about my country, but I suspect the same is true here, who have run out of ideas. I mean, really what you're talking about in the creative class in, in Western society at the moment is the children of a liberal elite who grew up confident, and then it failed. 
And those children went into the creative industries, a bit like that lot, but not for the same reasons. They went into the creative industries in the 80s. But they haven't got anything to say. So they invented postmodernism. And now they've invented, and now they've invented archaeology, sort of ar almost an archaeology. I mean, have you noticed how much music is basically just archaeology of past forms of music? It's not even reinterpreting it, it's archaeological. And however clever an in inverted compass it is, actually what it is, it's a smokescreen to disguise that the most pampered generation of individualists ever in the history of the world hasn't got anything to say. And I'm just a journalist, but I do try and say things because I think it's wrong not to say things. Often I get it wrong, and I'm, go and I'm actually just as bad, I'm going back and digging up the past and trying to s and reworking it. So in a way I'm criticising myself. But it's important to try and say something about it. I'm tending not to, st I can't talk about the future because I don't think anyone knows about the future. But I do think it's absolutely, it, the left is just, a, the failure of the left is just part of it. It is the most indulged generation ever and it hasn't got anything to say. And that's absolutely shocking. That's what I think, and I include myself in that. <laughs>